Hey guys, Chris here. Normally we have stories about people that are camping, hunting, or hiking in the outdoors when they have an encounter. But many times there are people just minding their own business and they're simply driving down the road and something happens. I got some stories on that. That's next. Okay, so I am in the studio tonight, and for tonight's beer from the 5050 Brewing Company, we have Donner Party Porter. Check that out. There's even a vulture on there lurking on the sides. And that is from Truckee, California. Not too far from here, over the uh, Donner Pass. Downer Party Porter. Wow, look at the, uh, it's like an amberish ale. Wow, that looks really good. I think I'm going to start doing a more in-depth review of the beer. And we'll have to have it into a glass to uh, observe it and get the aroma out of it. And then obviously to taste it. So anyways, Downer Party Porter. Here we go. Oh, that's a... Uh, it's a definitely a darker beer, but it's got a very, almost a buttery taste. Very smooth as well. Good aroma to it. Yeah, it's really tasty though. Not a real bitter aftertaste at all. So, Donner Party Porter. <laughs> Cheers. Our story takes place in the Ocala National Forest, which is 442,000 acres of wild country in north central Florida. There in 2004, Randy was working for the Forest Service maintaining over a hundred miles of dirt road for logging trucks using a grader. That day in June of 2004, it was 95 degrees and he was by himself about five miles away from human habitation. So Randy continued to grade this road and he suddenly looked up and he saw off to the left about 150 yards in front of him to the left of the road he saw this large upright dark brown creature standing there on the side of the road with its head turned looking directly at him. He said it was six and a half to seven feet tall. It was frozen, not moving, just staring right at him. He took the grater, put it in neutral, and he was just idling, staring right back at it. They did this for about a minute and a half, neither of them budging. He didn't know what to think of it, but it startled him. Then after the minute and a half, this thing turned its head straight, took three giant steps across this 16 to 18 foot wide road, and disappeared into the forest. Once the creature disappeared into the forest, Randy continued to grade the road, and in about three minutes, he showed up at the location where he had saw this creature cross the road. He turns the grader off, gets out of it, and comes down to investigate. He finds on the road some footprints. A couple of them are in the hard-packed part of the road, and you can't really see too much, but there's a, two footprints that were 12 inches long, proportional to a human's, but they were seven inches wide, really wide. And they could see them go off the road into the brush, and he followed them, and he could see where there were broken branches where this creature went through the forest and disappeared. Then while Randy was standing at the edge of this forest, he did something really interesting. He yelled out, I am leaving food and water for you. Doing an act of kindness for a Sasquatch. He proceeded to leave food and water. I don't know exactly what that means. Probably had something in his lunch and some kind of a dish or container for water. And he put it in the forest for this Sasquatch. He continued to grade the remaining three miles of this road upon his return pulls up on the other side, 
He got out and checked. The food was still there. The water was still there. It was untouched. Randy described the creature as six and a half to seven feet tall, dark brown to black with hair covering almost all of its body except for its face. He said its head appeared to be set forward on its shoulders, creating this hunched posture with no visible neck. Randy also mentioned that the arms of this creature were long, proportionally longer than a human's, and they swung back and forth as it walked across the road. He also mentioned that it was twice as husky as him and bigger and bulkier, much bigger. And he was a really big guy. Randy also stated that he did not tell anyone about this experience. He did not want to jeopardize his job. He didn't know how people would interpret this. He also said he's certain of what he saw and he was willing to take a lie detector test about his experience. He had seen everything in that forest as far as animals and wildlife or so he thought until that day. And he said that this is real and this has changed him. So our next story takes place in the Plumas National Forest of Northern California, 1,146,000 acres of wild country, forests, rivers, mountains of the Northern Sierra in California. There in 1992, Gary was driving with his friend Kevin and they were in his 1987 Dodge Caravan. It was a clear night, fall of 1992, about 10 p.m. and they're following the Feather River heading north and it's a lot of pine trees and it can be very dark in there. They're heading towards the Greenville Y which is Highway 89 and Highway 70 intersect there and they create this like a Y. And they were on their way to head north and east to Susanville to see Gary's parents. They're following this road, Highway 70, the Feather River Canyon Highway. And I've been on this highway before. I know this spot, I know this location. And Jeanette and I have done a lot of activities in this national forest. We mountain bike, we hike, we kayak, we love it up there. They were coming around this big left-hand turn, big slow left-hand turn. He slowed down to about 45 miles an hour heading for the Greenville Y. As they're coming around this curve, they slowed down to 45 miles per hour and they saw in their headlights up ahead on the right lane, their lane, a large animal standing there. Fortunately, he slowed down enough and he was able to avoid hitting it and go into the left lane. And now he came to almost a crawl as they saw this large animal covered in hair with its back facing to them on all fours, looking up the highway with its head turned to the left. As they're driving by, this took about five or six seconds. They were in awe of this thing. It was huge. It was massive, as big as a horse. As they're driving by, this thing that was in the road was slowly being revealed to them. They could see it was large, hairy, dark brown hair, had these what appeared to be long legs on it. They're slowly driving by took about five or six seconds and they got to the head and they were surprised because the face was flat like a human's. Did not have a muzzle or a snout on it and they were in shock because it looked almost human but it wasn't. They were really creeped out by this because it was a large mammal, unidentified mammal, on the highway at night and it had a human-like face on it. Right then this thing lowered its head and looked into the passenger side window where Kevin was sitting. 
Kevin was looking directly at it was only just a few feet away. Kevin was in shock. Gary felt that they were in danger, so he stepped on the gas right then because he didn't know what this thing was going to do, if it was going to chase them or what. They're driving away. They both look at each other. They didn't say a word. They finished this big curve to the Greenville Y and take a right and go up the road and pull over to the side of the road. They immediately started talking and saying, what in the world was that? It was not a bear. They both agreed it was not a bear. They'd seen bears before. They lived in that national forest. The face really threw them off, seeing this human-like face on this large animal. Really freaky. And it wasn't until years later they realized it had to have been a Sasquatch that was standing on its hands and feet on Highway 70 that night in the Plumas National Forest. They both had a really hard time with this, dealing with this. They didn't talk about it very much, and they both agreed that they were really unsure what was really in that forest. So our third story takes place in western Montana. I used to live in Montana. Mike, who lived in Salmon, Idaho, would take Highway 93 out of town and head north up over the Lost Trail Pass and come down the other side into the Bitterroot Valley of Montana to visit his father in Darby. Darby, Montana. His father had a very small cabin that he lived in, so Mike could not spend the night there, but he would spend the day with him. They would have a nice time, they would have dinner, and then he would make the trip back over the pass at night, usually late at night. Come back over Highway 93, up over Lost Trail Pass, and there's a series of really steep switchbacks down the other side of the mountain to Salmon, Idaho, where Mike lived. In January of 2009, Mike had visited his father in Darby. They had a nice time. They wrapped it up. He was on his way back. It was pretty late. It was after 10 o'clock, which was kind of normal for him. And he was coming back up the highway. It had snowed about three days earlier, and the snow was piled on each side of the road from the snowplow about two or three feet deep on either side, all the way up to the pass. Idaho-Montana border. That night on his return trip to Salmon, Idaho, he noticed the sky was clear, there were no clouds, there was no wind, there was also no other traffic that he had passed or had seen. The road was deserted. He said that the moon was so full and the stars were so bright and the snow was so white, you could have turned your headlights off and driven by the moonlight. He came around the third or fourth curve down from the pass and he saw a large amount of snow had been knocked off the snowbank onto the road and it spread out about eight feet across the road. And he figured not much time had passed when, since this had happened because if it had another vehicle at some point would have driven down the road and made tracks over the snow. So he knew it had to be fairly fresh. As he came to this curve, he slowed down, half expecting to see an elk on the road or just off the road. What he saw shocked and surprised him. He looked off to his right and he saw a large upright creature heading up this 45 degree slope and disappearing over the top. It was on two feet in the deep snow. He was amazed at the size of its leg muscles. Even in the moonlight, he could see the strength in its legs. He said it was massive. It was like looking at a horse's leg. He could clearly see this thing had reddish brown hair as it crested this 45 degree hill and disappeared in the snow. 
He was amazed at how big and powerful this thing was. He said its shoulder blades stuck out like it was a football player with shoulder pads on, tapering down to this narrow waist. He knew if it had not been a moonlit night, he would not have seen anything. He quickly turned his vehicle perpendicular to the road and aimed his headlights up the slope where the creature had just gone and left tracks to the top of this hill. He sat there stunned. He had just seen a Bigfoot. With his truck now blocking the road, he could clearly see in the headlights the tracks in the snow from his truck. They were 8 inches wide, 15 to 16 inches long, and about 5 feet apart or so between each step. He could see six or seven prints on either side of the road. Mike wanted to get some pictures, but he realized after seeing how fast this thing went up the slope, he thought if it came back down the slope, it could come just as fast and it could be on him in a moment. And he felt this fear take over. He sat there in his truck with his 45 automatic handgun hanging out the window waiting for another car to drive by so he could show them what he had just found. And then he could get some pictures. He waited for 15 minutes and no one came by. And the fear was really starting to take over and he thought it was best just to get out of there. So he rolled up the window and drove the rest of the way down to Salmon, Idaho. All the way down the mountain, he was mad at himself for not getting out of the truck and having the courage to get some pictures when he had the chance. He got to Salmon about 2 a.m. and he could not sleep the rest of the night. The next time he went up to Montana, he told his dad, I want to move you down to Idaho with me so I don't have to drive this stretch of road at night. After hunting for nearly 30 years, he said he sold his camper and he no longer hunts anywhere near there. Mike said he's been to Vietnam and nothing really scares him. But that night he felt a fear that he'd never felt before in his life. And that is my stories for tonight. <laughs> Pretty frightening to be by yourself on the road late at night and have something totally unexpected come out and possibly change your life. So that is my stories for tonight. Thank you guys for watching. I really appreciate it. And I appreciate you guys. And if you guys like stories about the strange, unexplained, and things that go bump in the night, please like and, like and subscribe. And also, if you have your own stories, please send to BasecampChris2 at gmail.com. I'll take a look and see what I can do. I read everything that I get. I can't post everything as a full episode, but I do what I can. And I love hearing your stories. So thank you so much. We'll see you next time. As always, keep hiking.